tonight. The previous slides before we get to tonight's was just reviewing what we were doing last time. So have a look at the video for last time if you need to be mindful of it. Um, and some of the rules that you're looking at last time, you will get a chance to practice as you go over. It's new stuff that we need to see tonight, these new rules. I want to look at three rules. The product rule. The quotient rule. And the chain rule. So that's my aim for tonight. Look at those three rules. And if you don't have calculus with me before, or you've done calculus before, you might recognize them. Well, the last one, is Yep. So it should be easy. It should be. We'll take them in turn. We'll look at an example of each one and how it might be used, and then I'll give you a chance to have a go at you. And then when we've had a go at one or two, then we'll move to the next rule, practice one, have a go at a couple, and then the next one. Okay? So we'll run out of rules or we'll run out of time. Okay, so let's start off with the product rule. Here's a function, y equals 3x squared times sine 4x. This is an example of where we would use the product rule. That's a 2x squared. Oh yeah, it looks a little bit like a question mark. If you really try hard, then it looks like a question mark. <laughs> We use the product rule when we're multiplying one function by another function. So the first thing is to recognise when you need the product. Recognise on the fact that you've got one function multiplied by another function. And if you look at it, we can see there's two functions. We don't get my magic hand to move again. Work again. Because that's one function involving x the variable x. What do I do to x? I square it and times the answer by 3. So that's a function that I'm going to apply to the variable x. If you look though, you'll see there's another function involving x. Sine for x, which means I've got to take my variable x, whatever it is, my independent variable, times it by 4, and then find the sine of that. So I'm doing two separate things to the same independent variable x. x appears twice, and I've got one function multiplied by the other. If there's no symbol or a dot in between, it means multiply. So one function multiplied by another. If I've got a situation like that, I use the product rule because product means multiply. The product rule for when you've got two functions multiplied together. So here, we have two functions multiplied together so we use the product rule write down the product rule mathematically and then in words because it's much easier to understand in words but you'll see it written down mathematically here it is using the notation dy by dx generally dy by dx but of course it doesn't have to be y and x it could be s and t or other letters but we write the form generally using y and x. 
equals u dv by dx plus v du by dx. Make sure your u doesn't look like a y. dy by dx equals u dv by dx plus g du by dx. So that's the product we're all written mathematically using mathematical notation. <clears throat> so first of all, what is u and what is v? Let's go back to the previous slide. U is the first function, and V is the second function. So what we do is we call the first function U, the second function V, to apply the rule. And in words, what that means is, the first function these are some abbreviation here the first function multiplied by the differential of the second function that's what that's saying If you look at this first part of the product rule, that's what it's saying. The first function multiplied by the differential of the second function. This part here. The first function multiplied by the differential of the second function. U times dv by the x. Plus the second function multiplied by the differential of the first and that's all it is that's the rule so we don't have to do anything further than what we've done already, really. We've got to differentiate these functions using that table of differentials that we've got already. But then we just have to apply those different or put those differentials into that rule. Are we all done? Can I move on? So let's look back at this example then. So we've got y equals 3x squared times the sine of 4x, is that right? 3x squared times the sine of 4x. Yeah, okay. So we've got u equals 3x squared. So du by dx equals 9x squared. No, 9x. 9x. Yeah, so I thought it was a 3. Uh, 9x. And then we've got v equals sine 4x. So what's dv by dx? It's minus 4 cos 4x or is it 4 cos 4x? Can you tell me, Mason? 4 cos 4x. Yeah. Sine becomes cos, so 4 cos 4x. Four Sorry. We need to find because it's not 6x. Yes. Yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah, because you thought it was a 3, didn't you? Yeah. All right. All the people who are now watching this video are quite relieved that it's now been changed to 6x. Well spotted. Now all I do is plug those things back into the product rule. So what does the product rule state? That differential of the whole function dy by the x equals the first part times the differential of the second part 
plus the second part times the differential of the first. <coughs> so we just write it which equals u, 3x squared, times the differential of v, which is 4 plus 4x, plus v, which is sine 4x, times the differential of u, which is 6x. And that's the solution. That is the solution. Sorry? That is the solution. Yes, that's the solution. Yes, you can. I'd expect you to try and tidy this up. If you look at this part here, this part, we this means three times x squared times four times cos four x. All these things are multiplied together. So I can do this in any order I like. I can do the 3 times the 4 bit. So any two numbers I can multiply together. 3 times 4 is 12. x squared times cos 4x. We always put numbers first, then terms involving x next, and then finally trigonometric functions. Because if I don't have the trig functions at the end, you're never sure whether or not you're finding the cosine of just a bit as well as the whole lot. So put the trig function at the end, and you won't have to worry about that. So I would tidy this up as 12x squared cos 4x. Plus, and then, how can, can we tidy up this second part at all? No, because the 4 is inside the sine function. So all we can do here is just put the 6x first and then the sine x. Sine 4x at the end. So 6x sine 4x. Which one of these quite popular? So the top line is yeah, and then the next line down is that. That was the 6x in line, in red. But, uh, yes, the 6x, that's the du by the x bit is 6x, so that's why the 6x goes there. No, what I'm saying is, is the, the next equation underneath the, the du over the x? That one? No, it's in the blue now. Yeah. All that there is one equation. Yes, yes, that's all. I just couldn't quite fit it all on one line, Andrew. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I should have made that point. Yeah, this is all one function. Actually, it might be worth just just so to clarify. This is the u bit, isn't it? Three x squared. This is the dv by dx bit, the four cos four x, and this is the v bit, and this is the dv the u by dx bit. So you can see each bit, and then what we're doing is combining them together. And then tidy up. Okay. When we tidy up, we collect like terms, and um, that's what we've done. So looking at this, whoa! <laughs> I don't know what happened there. <laughs> oh my goodness! Right, okay. Try again. I think I might have actually got it to do something. No. <laughs> right. Look at this. Okay. Um, we've got two terms. So one thing we can do is try and collect like terms, which is what we've just done. And then another thing we can always try and do is factorise. If we've got lots of different terms, we can try and take common factors from each term. And if you look at this, there's at least one x in both of these. And 6 goes into 12 and 6 goes into 6. So I can take a 6 and an x outside the bracket and then decide what I'm left with inside. 
6 times 2 gives 12, so that would make it be a 2x inside, because 6x times 2x gives me back my 12x squared, cos 4x plus sine 4x. So I will try and factorise it. And again, good practice. Thinking about the exam that's coming up, you know, that, that can mean the difference between a pass and a good pass, a good pass and a merry. All this sort of stuff is demonstrating mathematical uh, okay. You will come across these things. We're going to come across examples when we look through some. Uh, yeah. Um, when you try and follow mathematical text, follow arguments, follow proofs, all this sort of thing is going on all the way through it. So if you don't see one step to the other, it's possibly just because of the algebra step like this. And so again, practice is important. So although that's correct, the first form we wrote down, tidying it up, is an important tool to add to your kit and your okay? So the differential finally is that 6. So we can finally write dy by dx equals 6x brackets 2x cos 4x plus sine 4x. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was going to do that next time maybe, right? And just to remind you, as Daniel was saying, these are functions that can go on the graph. This second function, this new function of differential, tells you the rate of change the gradient of the original function. What was the original function? 3x squared times 4x. So again, if we go to autograph, uh, close this page, start a new page, and type in the function y equals 3x squared sine 4x. And we get this function. Okay? An interesting function. I think might agree. Okay? Zoom out on it, see what it looks like. What sort of thing would that represent in a real world situation? Um, Something like that. Can't think of how why we might get three x squared times four x, but certainly one that we will be looking at, like the exponential function multiplied by a trigonometric function, comes from some sort of damped sine wave that disappears exponentially, a combination of an exponential function and a sine function. There may well be applications for this, but I can't think of it. But it looks quite an interesting function, doesn't it? Yet times the x by the x squared means it's going to, you know, disappear off quite quickly. Uh, but this new function that we've just talked about allows you to find a gradient of this what looks like quite a complex function at any point. And all we've got to do is what we've just done, apply this new rule, but then just use these things on the table. It's exactly the same procedure, really, just find these little differentials, add them up, tidy it up a bit with a bit of algebra, not much maths really on this page. And if I now type in this new function, y equals 6x, Uh, 6x, open bracket, put glasses on, uh, what's the rest of it, 2x, cos 4x, plus sine 4x, close bracket, okay, we get a new function in blue, and that new function is telling me what the gradient is at any point. So again, if I just zoom in on one part of the graph, let's just focus in on this bit here. Um, beyond zero, so zero being about here somewhere. This red function is the original function, the blue one is a differential. So if I take one point on the graph, say here, then what is the value of the gradient of that point? This. So if I look across to here, what's the gradient of this line, of this function at this point, about 2.4, 2.5. Okay. 
what's the rate of change of this function here? Two point five. So powerful tool. If we find an application for this, what we're doing is saying, what's the rate at which y is varying with x instead of y? So where the blue line is crossed into the x-axis, that's where the red line is crossed again. Well, the blue line... It's degrading at that. It's the first to cross to zero, the degrading is the opposite. Is that where it's the same? Well, what is the value of the gradient at this point? Zero. Zero. So that must mean at this point, this line must be horizontal. Yeah. So at that point, it might well start to then go down. So yes. Good point, Ethan. So if we um, just close this little thing, and just to confirm that, let's zoom in on this little point here, and we should find it's some sort of maximum value, shouldn't we? So uh, zoom in. Um, at that point, actually, oh, I missed it, didn't I? It wasn't there. It was over here when the gradient dropped to zero, which was. Um, right, now to go to default, back to default scale, scales. Where was it we were looking at? Around about here somewhere, wasn't it? So if I zoom in on that point of the graph, this point, where the gradient drops to zero, which is this point here, there, then it looks as though we've got a maximum at that point because the gradient at this point there is zero, isn't it? So it's peaked at that point. And last week when you were here, we were talking about using this fact that when the gradient drops to zero, you reach some sort of maximum value to the function of the maximum. So you can find points of maximum in this function. We go back to the original default scales again and zoom out. We actually find that the gradient goes to infinity. So it looks like this function goes off to infinity. Okay, enough on that. No, I don't want to say changes. So, let me give you one to have a go at. <coughs> right, there's a function. Do I need to use a product rule? Yes. Yeah, because I've got x appearing twice, one function involving x, an exponential function, why is it not working? And then another function involving x, um, the cosine function, and then multiply together. So, check it out, apply the product rule. And let's just have a look. Now, of course, with practice, because I've used this pr the product rules so much, and you would eventually, if you do get to a position where you're using these rules a lot, you remember it in your head and you just write it down. U is the first bit. So it's going to be U, which is 5 e to the 2x, times the differential of the next bit, which is minus 3 sine 3x plus the second part, which is cos 3x times the differential of the second bit, which is 10 e to the 2x. So with practice, you can just literally write the answer down. And that's what you should do. 3 minus 3. Because when I differentiate cosine, I get minus sine. Minus oh, okay. uh, and then we tidy up. Uh, I put the brackets in here just to show that that is the differential and I really put it in to make sure I don't forget that that minus means it's multiplying by this. If I hadn't put the bracket in on this one here, just to sort of zoom in on it, then that might have meant 5 e to the 2x minus 3 sine 2x. So you not what I mean. Minus 15 e to Yeah. That's exactly what we do next. Minus 15 e to the 2x sine 3x plus 10 e to the 2x plus 3x. So that's the next step. And then, as I've tidied up, I've collected together like terms, and then I look at the factors that are common. Certainly 5 is common to both. 
and so is e to the 2x. So I can take 5 e to the 2x outside the bracket, leaving me with minus 3 sine 3x plus 2 cos 3x inside the bracket. I am zapping along here, but you can look at it more slowly later when you go through it. Okay. Uh, last step, as I was saying with John, inside the bracket, it's not good practice to start with a negative. So swap these two terms inside the bracket. 2 cos 3x minus 3 sine 3x. And that would probably be the best way to leave it. But that's not to say that any of these ways of writing the differential are correct, because they are. Right there, that's what we're saying. Just one more, we've got that minus in the first place, so Because when we differentiate cosine, we get minus sine. Okay. So sine and cosine are the opposite. So, yeah, five cosine would always be. Minus five yeah. Sin, because of this table that we wrote down, look, cosine becomes minus sine. Okay. Sine becomes cosine, cosine becomes minus sine. So we just need to remember that or look at the table. So that's that solution, okay? Right. Now I want to move on and um, look at the next rule, okay? Because again, I think what we're going to struggle with here is not the rule so much as the differentiation. So the quotient rule, which is the next rule, again, is just something we do with two functions, but the bit that we need to worry about, as before, is what do we do about the differentials and how do we tidy up that? So let's look at an example of this quotient rule. So again, I'm going to start off with an example. I use familiar functions, so we're not uh, worrying too much about trying to do all these differentials of square roots and inverse functions and stuff like that. Let's just look at the rule to start off with. So hopefully they're quite easy to differentiate. Now we have a situation where we've got one function, sine x, divided by another function, 3 equals 2x. There so are two functions here, because x appears twice, but we now have a situation where one is divided by the other. So the rule we use here is the quotient rule. Quotient means divide. So we use the quotient rule. Here. One function divided by another, Use the quotient rule. Again, I'm going to write it down and then put it in words. Looks a little bit more involved than the product rule, but it's, it's exactly the same idea. You just follow the rule. So, let's um, write it down dy by dx. Okay, be careful with the y's and the u's, make sure they don't look the same. Equals v u by dx minus u dv by dx all over v squared. That's the question really. We can show where that rule comes from, but uh, it's beyond what we need for this course. There's no need for us to do it, but actually if you go back and look at the calculus text, you can actually show how that rule is arrived at and it's not. 
too complicated to do. But all we need to do is accept and we'll press the I believe button and that's the rule we're going to use. As an engineer, that's all we're interested in. <laughs> but in words, of course, we can write down what that is. All we have to do is, again, think about what's U and what's V. Unlike the product rule, it's important which one is U and which one is V. So let's go back to the slide we had before. It's always the case that the top function is called U and the bottom function is called V. It's important that you get it the right way around because the V squared in the quotient we will use the bottom part squared. So you must make sure you remember that V is the bottom bit, U is the top bit. So what does it mean? In words, it means the second or the bottom function. I could of course use the correct term for the bottom function in fraction, which is the Denominator, yeah. So the denominator or the bottom function multiplied by the top, the differential of the top function or the numerator minus the top function multiplied by the differential of the bottom. Function, but then unlike the, the extra bit which the product rule doesn't have, all divided by the bottom function squared. So that's how you might say that quotient rule in words. And have in your mind as you do it. So that eventually you can just trot out the answer. Take the bottom function, write that down. Multiply that by the differential of the top. And with practice you can write that answer down. You don't need to be able to work it out. Minus the top function, multiplied by the differential of the bottom. And then all divided by the bottom function. So So what we need to do now is to do that for this function. So what was the example we had? Sine x over 3 e to the 2x. So y equals sine x over 3 e to the 2x. Again, let's set it out like we did before. Let's write down what u is sine x, write down what the differential of that is, what's the differential of sine, just cosine, write down what v is, the bottom function is 3e e to the 2x, and what's the differential of that, which is 6e e to the 2x, and then Plug those into the quotient rule. Now you must have a bit more room this time, don't get it all on one line, Andrew. So dy by dx equals sine x minus u dv by dx all over v squared. Uh, it's the bottom function, 3 e to the 2x, in this case, all squared. So this maps to be 9 e to the 4x? Yeah, correct. If you were doing this question in the exam, it might be a good idea to write down this question rule, because then at least I recognise that a 
applying the right rule, even if you do it wrong after that. You still you try to apply the quotient rule to this particular question. It's got to be good. Okay? You were being honest. Yeah, it could well be. Yes. If you're really struggling for marks, it could be. <coughs> so, dy by dx equals v v equal to 2x times the differential of u, which is cos x. Minus u, which is sine x, times the differential of v, which is 6 equal to 2x. All over v squared, 3 e to the 2x, all squared. So you could write that. And that is the solution. That is the differential function. That's the new function that allows you to find the rate of change of that top function, sine x over 2 e to the 2x. However, I would expect you to attempt to tidy this up. Okay? Certainly, we can multiply any numbers together, and there aren't any two sets of numbers in either of these terms on the top, so I would just put the 3 e to the 2x first times cos x, which is in the right form in the first one, put 6 e to the 2x first, and then the sine x. And then I'd try and work out what this 3 e to the 2x squared was. So dy by dx equals 3 e to the 2x cos x minus 6 e to the 2x sine x all over. Now if I'm squaring this, I square everything that's inside the bracket. So I square the 3 to get 9. And then I get e to the 2x squared. And if you think about the laws of indices, that becomes 2x times 2, doesn't it? Which is 4x. Could you have put 3 e 2x outside the brackets at the top and show cos x minus sin x 2? Yes, you can. Yeah. We're ahead of the game there, Mason. So let's have a look at that now. No, that's fine. Yeah. So dy by dx equals, let's factorise 3 and e to the 2x. We come outside at the top. Leaving cos x minus 2 sine x inside a bracket all divided by 9 e to the 4x effectively. And maybe we can see now why it's a good idea to factorise, because I can actually do some cancelling out here. Uh, probably the easiest way to see how the cancelling works is to look at it in this form here. So let's see if I can get this pen to work. And look at this. Oh, okay. Oh, that's all right. Um, I've got e to the 2x at the top and e to the 2x squared at the bottom. So I can actually cancel out one of the e to the 2x's at the bottom with the e to the 2x at the top. So. Go away. I wouldn't mind if it was consistent. Okay, so I actually can cancel out this e to the 2x here with one of the e to the 2x at the bottom because e to the 2x squared means e to the 2x times e to the 2x, so I get rid of that, leaving just e to the 2x on the bottom. Another way of thinking of it is, if I do e to the 2x divided by e to the 4x, that's the same as e to the 2x divided by e to the 4x, using laws of indices means e to the 2x 
minus e to the whoops, minus 4x because I subtract the powers when I um, divide 2x minus 4x is minus 2x which is 1 over e to the 2x so I'm, in other words either way of looking at it I'm left with e to the 2x on the bottom and again 3 goes into 3 once 3 goes into 9 3 times so I'm actually left with cos x minus 2 sin x over 3 e to the 2x of the final answer you could bring the e to the 2x and put it e to the minus 2x, but how would you like that? E to the 2x on the second fraction, where you've got that second fraction bit. Here? Yeah. What is that gone, do you say? Is that gone? Yeah, I'm just cancelling down. And I'm trying to demonstrate how that cancelling works here by. Um, yeah, so you've got rid of 2x um, e to the 2x. Yeah. So you've got to 3 e to the 2x instead of yeah. 9 e to the 2x. Yeah. So that's how you got rid of that e to the 2x. That's correct. Yeah, another way of thinking of it is it's 4x, yeah. 2x minus 4x, yeah. which is minus 2x. So these 2x are possible. I mean, I'm not saying this is easy, but it's algebra, you know, and it all comes with practice. I find it quite straightforward now, so I start to forget how difficult I found it when I was sitting in your position. And I did find it difficult when I was in your position, you know, I'm no genius at these things. But it just comes with practice. Okay, uh, I think you might agree that that form, this final form, dy by dx equals cos x minus sine x um, over 3 to the 2x is a much more straightforward way of writing that final differential than this. Okay. So there is a point to tie these things up. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do often with these things is come up with a formula to find something out that someone is going to use. So the more straightforward you can make that formula, the easier it is to use. Them. Let me give you one to have a go at, okay? y equals um, 4x cubed over sine x sine 2x and y equals um, Have a go at those two. I'm going to give you a little block of time now to try those two out. And if anybody's trying, thinking of being a bit more ambitious, try this one. So that's three to have a go at. I'll leave those three up for a while. Work together on these things. And give me a yell if you get stuck on. So let's have a look at these examples then. Applying the rules as we go along, I'll take each one in turn. Let's just minimise that. So y equals 4x cubed over sine 2x. To do this one, I know I'm going to use the quotient rule because it's one function divided by another. And because I've done so many of these things, I can just think of it in words as I'm going along. Bottom function, sine 2x times the differential of the top function, which is 8x squared, minus the top function, which is 4x cubed, times the differential of the bottom function, which is 2 cos 2x, all divided by the bottom function squared, which by convention writes sine squared 2x. 4, 3 to 12, what did I put? Eight. How the hell did I manage that? Call myself a mathematician, I think. 
that's well spotted, that was a mistake, didn't fool you. And then I look at it, and four times two I can combine in this second part at the top, four times two is eight. And so at the next step to try and tidy up, I put the twelve x squared first, times the sine to x, minus four t is an eight x cubed cos two x all over sine squared two x. Then finally, I'd look at it and try and factorise. These are the common steps we always go through. Um, there's an x squared term in both, and 4 goes into 8 and 12, so I can take 4x squared outside the bracket, leaving me with 3 sine 2x minus 2x cos 2x, all over sine squared 2x. And that can't go any further than that as it stands. There are other ways I can go with this using trigonometric relationships and splitting the fraction. So, as an extension activity, at this point, if anybody cares to have a go at it, and I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to start it off. In this step here, I could rewrite this as 12x, whatever it was, squared sine 2x over sine squared 2x minus 8x cubed cos 2x over sine squared 2x. And then I could think about using some trigonometric identities, which is a chapter in a textbook I've been discussing with one or two people. You could play around with that. Then you can do a bit of cancelling sines top and bottom, cos over sine, that's an identity. So you could play around with that and write it in another form. Neither of these answers are particularly are correct. You know, one is not more correct than the other, it's just another way of writing it. And you might want it in one form one time and in another form another time. So I'll leave that there. Have a go at it if you feel like having a go at it so, as an extension. That's the first one. Obvious questions? One more one. Okay, let's have a look at the next one then. Going back to the slide I had, y equals 5e to the 2x sine 4x. That's completely gone out of the head, what was it? 5e to the 2x times sine 4x. So again, this is the product rule. So, um, as I can do it, as I'm going along, because I remember the words, I've done it so many times. First part times the differential of the second part, which is 4 cos 4x plus sine 4x times the differential of the first part, which is 10 e to the 2x. Tidying up, 5 fours are 20. Plus, write the 10 e to the 2x first and the trig bit at the end. And then look for common factors. 10 goes into both of those numbers and e to the 2x can come outside the bracket, leaving 2 cos 4x plus sine 4x. So that's that, that's those two. You can run to this way to leave notes later or play the video back if you want to take it a bit more slowly. Um, let's look at the last one because that's quite an interesting one. Y equals sine x over cos x. <coughs> if you look at the trigonometric identities that are useful here you might, and you get to know them, you might instantly recognise that the tangent of x equals the sine over the cosine. And these trigonometric identities are, are set out in the textbook. If you need any trigonometric identities in the exam, you'd be given them. And if you need any trigonometric identities to come in useful as you're doing in your engineering work that you're doing, 
waveforms and stuff like that, which involves these true major identities, you could always look at them from data books. So you're not expected to remember these things, but some of them you tend to, and that's maybe one of the ones that you might remember, that tan is sine over cos. So what I'm actually doing is actually to find what's the differential between tangent and x, which is a standard differential. You might see it written down in some tables, but what you do is prove what that is using the quotient rule. So, thinking about what it is in words, it's the bottom function times the differential of the top function, which is sine becomes cos, minus the, the uh, top function, which is sine x, times the differential of the bottom function, which is minus sine x, all over the bottom function squared. So I get that. Which equals cos x times cos x is cos squared x. Or the cos of x squared. Minus sine x times minus sine x is plus sine squared x all over cos squared x. I guess you to here. Now you've got two ways you can go. First of all, you can use another identity, another trig identity, which again you can find in the textbook, which says that cos squared x plus sine squared x equals 1. And that's another common identity that some people remember. So instantly, if you remember that, you can recognize the top one is just 1. So this becomes 1 over cos squared x. And another identity that you might recognize is that 1 over the cosine is a secant or sec x. So recognizing another identity that 1 over the cos is sec x or secant, you get the final answer sec squared x. So what's the differential of tangent sec squared x? And that's a standard differential that you might see the table differential using these trig identities. Oh yeah, see you're looking at your handbook there, Dan. Well, yeah, you should see those right, trig identities. No, 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 surprising if they're not. But the other way I can go down this route is split this. I can split this into two fractions. Cos squared x over cos squared x plus sine squared x over cos squared x. I can always split a fraction with two terms on the top like that. And then cos squared x cancel, leaving just one. And using the identity we had at the beginning, Tangent is sine over cos, so this becomes 1 plus tangent squared of x. And that's the other solution you could think. And they are actually the same. So, um, an interesting one because it introduces the idea of trigonometric identity. And when you differentiate trigonometric functions, that's something to look out for. Can you use an identity to simplify it or write it in another form which might be useful? Okay, I don't want to go much further down that route because the exam you're going to be doing is not going to be focusing on these things. So I thought I'd just share it to you as an example. Okay. Questions or comments? Yeah, yeah. You will need more practice. Once you get used to doing the differentials and using that table, then these rules will become much easier because they're just using those, that table, aren't they, really, and then just charging the question. So if you feel as though you need practice, probably the original differentials using that table, using the rules of the are beginning to practice and get used to. Let me just show you the last rule now, this chain rule. And I've got that one I want to show you, uh, even to remind me when we've done this chain rule, to have a look at that example you found in the book. Have you still got it? Um, 
So the chain rule then, let's look at an example of one where we would use the chain rule. It's sometimes called, and I think in some ways this is the easiest way to uh, think of it, the function of a function rule. So you will hear this rule sometimes called the function of function rule. And that second way of thinking about it probably describes a bit more clearly what it actually does. So let's have a look at an example. Y equals E to the sine 2x. Or y equals um, sine squared 3x. There are two examples that, to differentiate, I would need to use the chain rule. X only appears once in both of those examples. But that's not to say there aren't two functions involved in it. If you look at it, and I wanted to work out what this was, what is y, looking at the top function here, let's give this magic pen yet another go, just look at this top function here, yeah? Um, x, if I want to find out what y is given x, what would I do? I'd work out what 2 times x was, then find the sign of it, so I apply one function to it to find the sine of 2x. Once I've done that, I'm then going to find out what e to the power of that is. So I'm applying one function, the exponential function, to another function. Let's look at this one. <laughs> Neat. Um, y, to find x, given x, how do I find y? Multiply x by 3. Find the sine of 3x and then square it. So again, I'm doing one function, the sine of 3x, and then another function after I've done that, the square function, to get y. So in both of these cases, I've got one function inside another, hence the function of a function. And these are both questions. Yeah, they're different examples of uh, functions, both of which have one function inside another and would require the chain rule to solve. So they're not connected, there's two examples. Okay, so um, let's try both of these, okay, and work out what you'd have to do using the function of function rule. So um, let's write down the rule, and mathematically, dy by dx equals dy by du times du by dx. By du, du by dx. Yeah. dy by du times du by dx. In this particular rule, it's very important that y's and u's are used because you've got to be very careful your y's and u's don't look the same. dy by du times du by dx. Make sure your y's and your u's don't look the same. <laughs> Just as a little aside here, the reason why it's called a chain rule, not that you're going to come across one of these, but you might do at some point. If I've got one function inside another, inside another, inside another, I have to keep applying this rule over and over again. And so I might end up with something like dy by du times du by dw times dw by dx, and so on, for however many of these functions there are inside another. Hence the idea of a chain, one after the other. And if you look at these, if you look at this top one, and I were to try, I could actually cancel the u du, leaving dy by dx. So actually, algebraically, that left-hand side is the same as this because the du's are cancelled out. If you, if you like. 
So I'm not doing anything new. I'm just creating a new variable called u. Likewise, um, if you look at this one, the du's could cancel and the dw's could cancel, leaving dy by dx. So the left hand side is the same as the right hand side. It's just that I keep introducing new variables to allow me to find a differential. It's probably going to be easy to show you by example what I mean. Okay, but that's what's going on. Okay, so um, that's the question of the function rule. And what you're actually doing is, in words, differentiate with respect to, and that's a common abbreviation for with respect to, in fact sometimes even WRT with respect to, as we say so often in calculus, differentiate something with respect to, this is a common abbreviation, with respect to the inner function and then multiply that by the differential of the inner function. And what I've tried to do here is to put into words something that's not easy to put into words. Again, it's easy to show by example, but that's the sort of thing that's going through my head as I apply this, this um, chain rule. I'm going to differentiate with respect to the inner function and then multiply that by the differential of the inner function. So let's look at this top example, the first example, y equals e to the sine of x and see how that works. y equals e to the sine of 2x. The first one we looked at, Danny. Now again, this u has been introduced. What is u? u is the inner function. This is u. The inner function. What do I mean by the inner function? You remember when we were talking about this function? If I wanted to work out what y was given x, I'd do the sine 2x bit first. So that's the, the inside function. If you think of it like an onion, to work out what y was, I'd do the inner bit first, the sine 2x, and then after that I'd apply the exponential function. To it. So the inner function, the first function that you would use, the inside function, I call u. And so now what I do is, I differentiate, um, just backtrack slightly, if I've called u sine 2x, this means I can rewrite e to the u. And u equals sine 2x. So I've got two separate functions, y equals e to the u and u equals sine 2x. Now I differentiate, what the chain rule tells me to do is to differentiate y with respect to the inner function, to u. So I find what's dy by du. And again, be careful of your y's and u's. dy by du equals e to the u. Because it's its own differential, isn't it? Get back to the table of differentials, e to the u is just e to the u. That exponential function is the only one that's its own differential. And then I'm going to differentiate u to get the u by dx equals differential of sine is cos to cos 2x. And 
then I apply the rule. dy by dx equals dy by du times du by dx. The chain rules you just written down once before. So rewrite what that rule is. Chain rule. So dy by dx equals dy by du, which is just e to the u, times du by dx, which is 2 cos 2x. Two and the final step, I replace u yeah I replace u with what I set u to be in the first place if we look back to the beginning of the example I let u equal sine 2x so at the end I replace u with sine 2x so the u by the x the y by the x rather equals e to the sine of 2x times 2 cos so you replace y with dy of dx yeah uh, here, John, not sure what you mean. Replace y with. Oh yeah, I'm differentiating, so y becomes the y by the x and differentiates. Finally, I probably two first, and then the exponential function just to tidy up. So two e to the sine two x cos two x. No, just for that last bit. So now I'm recording again, folks. You might find that the video jumped to this bit. We've got loads of stuff coming before, unfortunately. I hope it wasn't a whole chain rule, but what's this example? So we've got one more example to have a look at that might well um, take a little more away. There's a log down there. Could well be, yeah. Two. I thought it was a log in there. Yeah. So what am I writing? Like that? Okay. Let's have a look at this one there. Okay. Okay, so we're going to apply the chain rule to this one there. So let me go through a bit more detail just in case I've missed recorded the previous one. So in the notes you might find that if you listen to this video that you've actually missed a few pages at this point for the chain rule. But um, let's apply this example of the use of the chain rule to one more. So um, chain rule because we've got one function inside another. To decide what the inner function is, let's have a look at it. Well, you can see it effectively, it's in the bracket, but if we think about it for a second, if I wanted to find out what x, y was given x, the first thing I would do is find out what the sine of x was, and then I would find the natural log of that. So the inner function, u, is sine x. So that's going to be our u. So what we do is, we let u equal sine x, which means we can rewrite the original function as y equals 2 natural log of u. Now we differentiate each part. Is, is u the power? Does that go as a power or is that just next to the natural log? No, it's just natural log of u. Because you let u equal sine x, so instead of it being the natural log of sine x, it's now the natural log of u. So now we're going to differentiate u with respect to x, and we're going to differentiate y with respect to u. 
looking at our table of differentials, sine, yeah, sine times cos x, 2 over x, 2 over u, yeah, 2 over u. Why is that? So now we combine them, dy by dx, the chain rule tells me that dy by dx equals dy by du times du by dx. In other words, I just multiply those two together, so dy by dx equals dy by du, which is 2 over u, times dy by du by dx, which is cos x. So not be 2 over? 2 over sin x. Yeah, because u we let be sin x, so finally I write that as 2 over sin x times cos x. But that could just as easily be written as 2 times sine x over cos x. And if you look at the trigonometric identities, sine over cos is 10. So if you answer, sorry, it's the wrong way around. I don't know that. Cos x over sine x, isn't it? Over sine x. Sine over cos is 10. So cos over sine is 1 over tangent, and if you look at the identities, 1 over tangent is cotangent or cot. So the final answer is 2 cot x. Cot is short for cotangent, which is the inverse of tangent. No, uh, no, because tan to the minus 1 means something different. It means the angle of tangent is. Which is why we need a new word to represent the inverse of tangent, which is cosine. Is that not the same as the other? I look at the side here. I put one over tangent x tan minus one. Tan. Yeah, tan to the minus one of um, an angle thirty. Tan to the minus one of say one point three six means the angle whose tangent is 1.36. And if you look on your calculator, you hit shift inverse tan, what do you get? Yeah, what is the shift inverse tan of 1.67? degrees. However, um, 1 over the tangent of um, One point three six means something entirely different. It means yeah, if we find out what, what the tangent of one point three six is, which would have to be now we're talking radians, one over that, it means entirely different. And we we write that as the cotangent of one point three six. So in other words, we can't use the inverse tangent to represent 1 over the tangent because well, that means the angle is tangent. Well, yes, but the only way you do that is work out what the tangent of the number is and then what 1 over that is. You've not got a button that does that on the calculator, true. So we, the reason why we use things like cotangent and secant for 1 over cosine and cosecant for 1 over sine is because tan to the minus one or sine to the minus one in this context means something different. It doesn't mean one over. Did you say secant is one over cosine and cosine is one over sine? Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit, uh, 
annoying, yes. Yeah. Counterintuitive. Yeah, it's a bit counterintuitive. You'd have thought that it would be the other way around. So, um, that was a bit of an aside. So, that's the chain rule. We've looked at three examples of the chain rule. Just to recap, let's go back to the chain rule. Here it is, or more commonly known as the function of the function rule. Use when you've got one function inside another. And we looked at these two examples of the two functions, one inside the other. I hope I've got the picture of that when I was highlighting and showing you. Um, there it is written mathematically. It can be applied to more to a whole chain of functions, one function inside another, inside another, inside another, hence the term chain rule. Um, in words, it can be written like this. And then we looked at some examples of how it can be used. One, two, three. Okay. Right. The time now is ten past eight. So we've got about half an hour or so. Okay, before we get to the end, we can concentrate on the more. Uh, you might want to go and grab a cup of coffee and stuff, because it's been a long day, hasn't it? So we've got the invite and the else afterwards, haven't we? So what I suggest we do is we spend about half an hour or so with a cup of coffee and have a go at some questions into the textbook uh, on the function of function rule, the product rule, and the function rule. So if I just show you in the textbook where to have a look.